Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is Sharon Derricks. Uh, I'm, I'm from Oxford, although I originally grew up in Durham, uh, so I'm also a northerner. Um, and yeah, I spend my time responding to people's difficult uh, faith questions. Um, so I see, can I write on lots of different things? I come from a scientific background um, uh, via brain imaging into this area of, of speaking and, and writing. everyone for, um, for coming out this evening um, to hear what someone might say to this topic of near-death experiences. Um, and it, it really is a, a fascinating area. Um, but I started out my university life probably more as an agnostic. Um, I came to, came to faith in Jesus Christ about halfway through that time. Um, but tonight we're going to look at near-death experiences. And I want to start by telling you a story about a, a medical student called George Ritchie, which happened in 1943. Uh, this medical student developed a double pneumonia, had pneumonia in both lungs, and this led to a cardiac arrest. And in the 1940s, there weren't many antibiotics, and so um, uh, there wasn't an awful lot could, they could do, and um, George Ritchie actually died. Uh, following an episode of very high fever and extreme tightness of the chest, he died. He stopped breathing and his pulse also stopped, and he was pronounced dead by the doctor on the scene, and he was covered with a sheet. Now, there was a, a male nurse that was present at this moment, and he was so upset by the death of this medical student, someone in the prime of their life, died suddenly, and he managed to persuade the resident doctor to inject adrenaline near the heart of this medical student, and um, he did, and George Ritchie revived. He regained consciousness. Having been dead for more than nine minutes, he regained consciousness, and um, it emerged during his spell of unconsciousness that he'd had, uh, of his spell of being clinically dead, that he'd had an extremely vivid experience um, that was, was extraordinary. And he went on to write about it in a book um, later called A Return From Tomorrow. He wrote about what happened to him in those nine minutes of that experience. And then he went on to qualify as a psychiatrist, um, and he began to share that experience with his medical students. And one of those medical students was someone called Raymond Moody. And Raymond Moody was the first person to use this term, near-death experiences. And he was so fascinated by what he'd heard um, George Ritchie say that he set out to study it systematically. And he uh, conducted um, 150 interviews um, of, of people that had undergone cardiac arrest. He published his results for the first time in 1975, he wrote a book, um, uh, which uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but um, 14 million copies were sold. Life Beyond Life, that's it. Um, and of course, the, the thing that you need to know is that there has been systematic study of this phenomenon since the 1970s. So here we are in 2024, there's been 50 years of study of this. Um, it's gone beyond simply kind of anecdotal one-off events. Um, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time going into all of the different studies because that's a bit kind of laborious, but except to say that there's been a lot. Um, there's a, a Dutch cardiologist called Pim van Lommel who's written about this in great detail and has written a book called Consciousness Beyond Life. Um, he looked at over 344 heart attack survivors. There was a study in Britain in 2001. Um, there's an American study uh, published in 2003. Um, and there, there was a study in Germany, 1998. Uh, another British study in 2006. And basically, between 1975 and 2005, there have been 42 studies 
covering more than 2,500 patients um, with an NDE, and these were published in scientific journals and monographs. There are things like the Journal of Near-Death Studies. There is the Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, which summarizes the whole of the first 30 years of research um, and data from patients. And in amongst all of this, somewhere between 5 and 10% of patients in these studies report having had some sort of vivid near-death experience. So there's a lot of data out there. But what does it mean to have a near-death experience? What are some of the features that have come out in these studies? Well, there are a number of characteristics that um, seem to have been in common. Even though these studies have happened in different cultures, with people of different uh, religious beliefs, and so on, there are a number of common features. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but there's a summary, I think, on the slide, yes. And um, one is that people seem to have an otherworldly experience. Some people describe unbelievably vivid landscapes and um, creatures and, and um, uh, kind of flowers and all sorts of things that um, is kind of otherworldly. It's something that almost can't be captured with with language, um, and even my attempts to use language here are very limited in terms of the kind of experiences that people were having. There's often a feeling of deep peace and quiet if the person was in pain when they were rushed into the emergency room, the pain is gone in this near-death experience. Um, often they have an awareness that they are dead. They, um, some of them might even hear the clinician um, pronounce that the person is dead, even though they feel very much alive. Some people have an out-of-body experience as well, that they um, perceive their um, situation from position outside of the body. You may have seen uh, various YouTube videos and documentaries of people being in various corners of the room looking down or in other parts of the hospital, actually. That's something else that people report. Um, some people report communicating with uh, deceased friends and relatives that they couldn't have known had died. Um, one instance of a, a whole family that were in a road traffic accident and a, and a child that had been unconscious and then came back and said, oh, I'm going because mummy and um, my brother are waiting for me. And he couldn't have known that his mum and uh, brother had actually just died moments earlier. Things like that that they could not have possibly known. People talk about meeting friends and relatives. Some people have a, a perception of a brilliant light or a being of light. Some people have their uh, panoramic life view. Their whole life passes before them. They have a chance to review it somehow. Some people have a perception of a border beyond which that is the point of no return to their body. And then another feature is people have a, a, an awareness of a conscious return to the body, um, that they are some sort of dragged back into their physical frame, um, which kind of marks the end of the experience, and that is often quite unpleasant. Some also, finally, might experience transformation. They may, it may really change someone's perspective on life as a result of their experience. So there are a number of commonalities, common features to these experiences that have been observed. Now, a question we need to ask is, what does it all mean? And how do we make sense of near-death experiences? And how do we make sense of them, especially in light of the view that um, that in some ways the prevailing view about human beings, that we are just our brains, that we are just physical beings. Uh, we are just the neurons in our head. That kind of drives who we are. Um, you might be familiar with Francis Crick, who is famous for co-discovering the DNA double helix. Uh, later in life went on to write about some of his philosophical views. And he said this, he said, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack 
of neurons? Well, it's one thing to ask you how you feel about that. Uh, it's another thing to, to say, well, how on earth do we make sense of NDEs if we are just packs of neurons? Because if we are just packs of neurons, when the brain dies, that ought to be the end of consciousness for the human being. Um, and so how, how are we making sense of NDEs? Is this evidence from the clinic that we are in fact more than just our brains, that there is more than we can see with our eyes? There is more to this world, to this life. Is there a non-physical realm? Is there an unseen realm? Well, of course, many would say, whoa, don't jump so quickly to those kind of conclusions because there are all kinds of ways that we could explain away uh, a near-death experience. And I want to spend a few minutes looking at those now. Uh, one uh, uh, one uh, critique of NDEs is that they are fabricated, that they are actually made up that the person may, whether intentionally or unintentionally, may have just sort of made it up because these are all very subjective and anecdotal. How do we know that they, they haven't just made it up? Well, there are some uh, NDEs that, uh, where the person actually makes an observation that was uh, verifiable. Um, so for example, um, there's a famous instance of um, someone that had an out-of-body experience at a hospital in Connecticut and they ended up um, floating to the, the, um, the roof of a hospital and observing in the corner of their eye a red shoe. And they, uh, upon resuscitation, talked about this and, uh, and someone that was really uh, kind of skeptical about what they were saying thought, well, I'll go and just double check that that isn't there, but in fact there was a red shoe. Um, another story is told of uh, uh, somebody that could recount a, a conversation they had in their out-of-body state, travelled down the hall to another part of the hospital and heard a conversation amongst their family members and was able to recount it later on. And there are instances of these, these um, things that could be verified. Often there's a clinician present that can kind of um, agree that, that that thing did happen or that observation was a real one. Um, and so there are some ways of verifying some of the observations that the person is talking about. In terms of fabrication, many of the accounts that are given by clinicians are given by people who have nothing to gain by doing so because the, the realm of, of um, um, medicine is extremely geared towards the physical. Uh, so any reference to a non-physical is not, is not looked kindly upon. There's also an instance of a, um, somebody who even you know, had a reputation to lose by talking about their own NDE. Someone called Eben Alexander, who was a former Harvard neurosurgeon, and uh, uh, before his own NDE, he was a very strict physicalist. A lot of his patients that he'd operated on came to tell him they'd had a near-death experience in surgery, and he, he said, no, if you don't have a working brain, a working cortex, you cannot be conscious until he himself developed severe bacterial meningitis at the age of 54. His entire neocortex had shut down all of the areas of the brain known to be connected with consciousness. And his family were told he wasn't expected to survive. He was in a coma for seven days, but extraordinarily he did pull through and make a full recovery. And he recounts an extremely vivid conscious experience, including meeting a sister who had died that he never knew he had. And that his, his recounting of her appearance matched a photo that he was later shown of her. And he said, my experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness. That human experience continues beyond the grave. And the thing for him was, why would you bother fabricating something that's really going to cost you your career to talk about? So the accusation of uh, the, the objection of fabrication does have 
some responses. Another objection is that these things are residual brain activity, um, that there is still some activity in the brain. Uh, some people say that NDEs occur because um, when you've got a life-threatening uh, situation, the, the decrease in oxygen in the brain can turn off some inhibitory cells and cause an increase in activity in some parts of the brain, particularly the visual cortex. And that's, you know, not an invalid objection. Um, we can't rule it out. But many of, there are some studies um, of, of patients where there is, they monitored the EEG signal in the brain and there was no detectable EEG signal, no detectable brain signal. <coughs> um, and also, there's something about the disproportionality um, of the kinds of things that people see under an NDE that are disproportionate to what you might expect for a brain in shutdown, a brain in its last moments of life. So there's residual brain activity. Then there are, um, the, some people say, well, maybe they are hallucinations. Well, there are people who've had an NDE and who've hallucinated, and they say that hallucinating and NDEs are two very different things. And in fact, you need a functioning brain in order to hallucinate. Um, and, and these people actually are in a, in a kind of state of clinical death where their brain is not functioning and therefore not in a position to, to hallucinate. So that leaves the, the, um, the fourth possibility, which is could it be that, this, that some of these, even if there may have been some that have been fabricated, that some of these instances are genuine and the people that have them certainly believe that they are. Is it possible that there is a non-physical realm as well as a physical realm? You see, um, if, if God does not exist and we live just in a, in a physical universe, then NDEs make no sense. They're, they're, they're an anomaly. They're, they're not the kind of thing we would expect to show up if all that there is is the forces of nature and physics and chemistry. But if God exists, we actually have a framework for making sense of NDEs. Because at the heart of the Christian faith is a, is a, is a God who claims to have overturned death. A God who said that the, end, the, the death of the body of a person is not the end of them. That actually there is life beyond um, death. And Jesus... Uh, said of himself, I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. <coughs> and so even though we don't, it doesn't answer all of our questions, there's a framework into which NDEs fit. They fit better if God exists than if he doesn't. And Jesus is saying something extraordinary here. He's saying that he is the one who will pave the way for life beyond death. Now, of course, you could say of, of the resurrection, you know, at the heart of the Christian faith is the, the belief that Jesus lived and he died to rescue us, to save us, as, as Yankee explained earlier. And then he rose. He defeated Death. He defeated the thing, that, the one thing that it seems that we can't do anything about in our own power. Now, I don't know about you, but if that, if that is true, then I, I actually really want to know for sure and really want to look into it for myself. Of course, the same objections that are raised against NDEs can be raised against the resurrection. That Maybe the resurrection was fabricated. Maybe the disciples just made it up. You know, they just decided to invent a story that, that they'd seen Jesus again, maybe to get the Romans off their case or something like that. Well, my husband um, became a Christian as a student, just as I did, even though we were at different universities. Um, and actually, one of the key 
points that really persuaded him was this. All of the followers of Jesus actually went on to die for what they believed. It took a while for some of them, but they all eventually died for their belief that, that Jesus had bodily risen from the dead. Now, why would you die for a lie? Like, they were convinced they'd seen the risen Jesus. And there was something about the, the passion with which they believed that that was very persuasive to my husband. Another objection is that Jesus wasn't really dead. Again, some residual life left in, in his body. There's a, there's a theory that he managed to somehow, you know, feign death and then revive in the tomb later on and then somehow find the disciples and, and because he was a bit pale they thought he was, he was kind of resurrected um, and then he went away and quietly died of his wounds while the disciples spread the amazing news. Well, if you look at the scholarship around this and there's a huge body of scholarship, you will see that the vast majority, whether people believe in God or not, they all agree that Jesus died. That he definitely died. And we also know that the Romans were brutal and very good <coughs> at killing people. And he definitely died. There's lots we could say about that. And so uh, the idea that he was still alive uh, and, uh, is, is not one that stands in the scholarship. In terms of whether the disciples were hallucinating, well, a hallucination is a, a, a very uh, personal experience that happens to one person at a time. But the New Testament accounts say that Jesus appeared to over 500 people over a 40-day period. Were they all hallucinating? Um, there aren't accounts of group hallucinations in, in psychological accounts. So it's very unlikely that all 500 of those people were hallucinating. So that leaves the remaining possibility that Jesus actually did rise from the dead. I wonder what you think about that possibility. As you know, as a, as a scientist, it can seem very kind of a bit out there. But if he did rise from the dead, what does it mean? And how does it help us answer this question? Is there an afterlife? Well, one thing I want to say is that being a Christian is not about waiting for a ticket to heaven. It's not actually about waiting for this moment when you can die and then be transported to another place. Actually, the Christian faith is more about that heaven came to earth as the person of Jesus Christ and overturned death so that anyone that follows him, the same will be true of them. But actually, it doesn't start when you die. It starts here. It starts in this life. There are some words of Jesus from one of his biographies that he says, eternal life, this is eternal life, that they may know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. In other words, eternal life begins when we get to know God um, through Jesus. It's Jesus that has made the way. And what happens when we get to know God is that dead things in our lives start to come to life again. And kind of our relationships, our friendships, our studies, our, our sort of sense of self, all of, all of these different parts of life are breathed into. They are, they come more alive again. That actually the, the life of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus breathes into every area of life. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sharon. The next question is... How about Christians who died but didn't get near-death experiences versus non-believers who had near-death experiences? Yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot that we don't understand. Um, and I think that, um, you know, um, 
if you want to know more about the Christian uh, framework of, of heaven, there's a lot of information at, at our disposal in the life of Jesus. So what Jesus started to say when, when he began to kind of um, speak and teach and, and do miracles and begin his ministry on earth, he said the kingdom of heaven is like this. And then he would demonstrate it by healing people and even raising them from the dead. There's also um, a, a book at the end of the Bible which talks about the kind of uh, what what is to come. It's sort of more apocalyptic genre of, of literature, but it gives you insight into what, what Christians mean when they are talking about these things. Um, in terms of why some people have them and some people don't, there's a, there's a lot in there. Some people think that, or I mean, some people just may have never had a, you know, a cardiac arrest or the kind of surgery that would warrant uh, a near-death experience. Some people may have had one, but don't remember it. A bit like, we all actually dream every night, but we don't always remember our dreams as well. There's something about some NDEs may be remembered and some may not be. But certainly, what it isn't, because of is that, that God kind of favours some people more than others. That he has actually most clearly made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ, and that is available to anyone and everyone that is interested. And uh, his words and life can be found in, in the Gospels, in the biography. The next question is for non Christians, what happens when you die? The first thing that I would definitely want to say is that, um, in a sense, you know, none of us know exactly where a person stands before God when they die, and and so I don't make it my business to kind of decide who 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 is, you know, calls themselves a Christian, who doesn't. There are people hold all kinds of different positions. Um, so I guess I guess the, the Christian framework. Um, is, is, is saying that uh, we are judged um, according to our life. Um, at the heart of the, the Christian faith is the God who cares about justice. Um, and he cares about justice because he is a God of love. Um, and so when, when kind of heinous crimes are committed, and we're seeing that all the time in the news, uh, it, it's part of our, our daily life. That calls forth from us a, a response of kind of anger. We, we're angry when we hear about injustice. And we do that because we care. And at the heart of the Christian faith is a God who is perfectly just. He doesn't let evil slide. And he does that because he's a God of love. Um, and, um, and so when, when we uh, stand before him, we are we are perf we are judged perfectly justly. There are no miscarriages of justice, um, and those who want to be with God for for eternity, which is essentially what the new heaven, new earth will be. Anyone that wants to do that, that is available. But He also doesn't force anyone to do that. And and then, and you know, I guess different theologians hold different views about that um, someone like C.S. Lewis would say that that then there's like you know there's separation f from God um, because if you've chosen not to do that then that's that's what uh, is available um, these are really difficult questions they they bring up all kinds of kind of mental images of God in our mind what I want to say is that God doesn't have favorites um, he doesn't send anyone to hell. He actually has uh, come so that anyone that wants to know him can know him and be with him in this life and in the one to come. Can you expand more on what you mean by the afterlife? Why specifically the Christian afterlife? I, I think there's something, um, thank you for the question, something unique about the Judeo-Christian framework in the sense of um, the... Um, the new heaven and the new earth is not a place where we lose our identity. So some concepts of afterlife are 
places where we actually lose sense of self. We actually you know, merge with the, the great consciousness and there's a sense of detachment mm. from that individuality that, that we were having and, and actually part of our journey on earth in those religions, some of them from an Eastern perspective, are to actually detach from our sense of personhood and, and, and merge with something that is more a kind of impersonal. Um, whereas actually Jesus bodily rose from the dead and says that we will retain our identity in the life to come, uh, except that all of the stuff that kind of got in the way of us being who we were meant to be here on earth will be gone, evil will be gone, um, there'll be no more death or crying, mourning or pain, um, those things will be gone. Um, and so there will only be good things. So all of the good things that we have on earth that kind of get slightly muddied and marred will be actually in a pure form. Um, but more than that, we'll actually, God won't be um, hidden in the sense that he is a little bit now, not because not he plays games with us, but it's part of him respecting our choice. There's enough of him that we can see and make sense of, but also he doesn't make it so obvious that we have no choice. Well, actually, once we've chosen him, actually, we will see him face to face. And um, actually, if I can, uh, someone that, as someone that never used to believe in God and then came to know God, the little glimpses of like being close to him that I've had, um, to the thought that that actually will expand and continue is it, um, it's something that is quite hard to explain, but it's a good thing. Um, I'm probably not making complete sense, but... So the, the Christian framework of heaven is that we retain our individual identity, we see God face to face, and the other thing is that it's physical as well as spiritual, that even the, though this world feels so real, as though it's going to go on forever, that actually the new heaven and new earth will be every bit as real, um, but it will be richer, and it will be fuller. And uh, the next... Three questions all have eight likes. That's one torn, but I'm going to go for the one at the top, which actually quotes Genesis 3, verse 19. So I've got up the full verse, and it says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. And the question is, does this not mean death is a curse from God? Well, thank you for the question. Um, and I don't know if the person asking the question is familiar with the biblical narrative or whether you're someone that reads the Bible, um, but um, for those that are not familiar, those are some verses that come very early in the story of humanity and their relationship with God, but they don't come right at the beginning. Right at the beginning, things were um, actually uh, better than that, that humans... Um, well, after the process of being made, that actually they were in a perfect relationship with God, but in which they had been given freedom um, to choose how they live. And the reason, the way they'd be given freedom was that there was an alternative to God in Eden. Whatever that place was where things began, there was an alternative. And humans used their freedom to say no to God, and in doing so introduced a brokenness into the human race. Uh, between human beings and God. Um, and one of the things that came about as a result of that was um, death. Um, and so the question is asking, is death not a curse from God? There were, and so my, my response to that is, in a sense, yes, there were consequences to early humans deciding to go their own way, deciding to turn away from their maker, but the rest of the biblical story is about God stepping in to overturn that, which culminates with he himself stepping into history as Jesus to rescue us. And that's why the resurrection is so important, that if the, the, that original consequence of, of death was death, then Jesus overturning it is, is actually the solution to the, the problem. It breaks the power of the curse if you like. The brokenness is mended. 
And that is actually the heart of what Christians believe, that Jesus has overturned this kind of kind of, um, kind of slavery or, or bondage that we, we're caught in because we try and live our lives on our own, we live them without God, but Jesus has come to, to change that, to rescue us and invite anyone that wants to follow him to be part of that. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's all we've got time for tonight. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you to Sharon for coming to talk to us tonight. Can we give her a big round of applause? <laughs>